Welcome, welcome to the mysterious Book Emporium. A group of refugee mazes from Hosburg wish to escape the Mage Templar War by becoming wardens. One of them, Valia, has come across something valuable. What happens next? Why don't you take a seat as we start Last Flight by Leanne Merciel, chapters 1 through 8. Chapter 1, 941 Dragon. Valia and four other mages from the Circle of Hosburg are walking to Weishaupt to become Grey Wardens, something that was set up in advance by the Circle in an effort to save some from the Mage Templar War. She can see the fear in the other's eyes, one being her senior enchanter, and three other mages, all just in their teens. They climb up to the Weishaupt gates, but stop at a small door hidden in the wall. Senior enchanter Eliphas knocks, and they are greeted by Sulwe, a scarred warden warrior. She takes them to the room for the night and says that they will be talked to in the morning. The next day, Solwood comes back to their quarters and takes Senior Enchanter Eliphas to a meeting. Soon after, another knock brings another warden, a handsome young elf named Caronel. He has brought them food and discusses what will come next. Barith, one of the mages, is infatuated with him and tugs her blouse a little bit lower. Valia thinks on how shameless she is at only 16. Caronel pays her no mind and asks how many have fought Darkspawn. Seika, also 16, says that he has after his family's home was attacked. He's the only one of the mages to have fought Darkspawn. Karenel tells him that until it's time for the joining, he has a task for them. They are going to go to the Warden's Library and search for archives of the Fourth Blight for any signs of weird activities, including blood magic, wardens just leaving, and talking or intelligent Darkspawn. When the children are done eating, he takes them to the Warden's massive library. The walls are carved with griffins, coat of arms, and various fruits, which Valia assumes are the foods the carver missed. Karna leads into a section of the library where the records of the Fort Blight are kept, but Valia doesn't notice. Her eyes linger on a giant glass sarcophagus. Large black horns stand on one side of the case, and inside, Valia realizes it's the armor of Garahel. She is awestruck, being this close to an elven legend. The man who led the assault against the Fourth Blight and the one to defeat the Archdemon and sacrifice himself in the process. Karenel tells them that he will be back to bring them to dinner and leaves, leaving the kids alone. They turn to Valia, who states that they should start with battle maps to get a better idea of how the war was fought. They find a large book containing all the battle maps, but as that doesn't prove useful to what they're looking for, all but Valia abandon it to other notes. Eventually, she comes to a map that has a city labeled in the elvish word for Griffin. She finds that curious, as it's unlikely that a human city would be named that, but that's when she notices the small shimmer of lyrium. She uses her abilities to draw from it in the words, Lath Bora Viran appear. There is no exact translation into any human tongue, so far as Valia knew, although the phrase could be clumsily reduced to the path to a place of lost love. It was a quote from one of the few great poems to be remembered through the oral traditions of the Dalish and the Elinages, and it described a wistful wish for beauty that one had never actually experienced in life. It was a sweet, painful sensation akin to nostalgia, but laced with a greater bitterness. For a nostalgic man remembers the pleasure he has lost, where one experienced Lathbora Viran longs for a thing that he can never really know. Under the blackberry vines, I felt it, Valia muttered under her breath. That was how the poem opened, with the musky fragrance of ripening blackberries, bitter and sweet, and a wish to remember the long-lost sense of Arlathan. She thinks it's a strange thing to leave on a battle map, hidden so that only an elven mage would understand its meaning. But she thinks for a moment, were there blackberry vines carved onto the walls? She searches and eventually finds one small carving of the vines next to a bench. She looks around and eventually finds just the smallest amount of lyrium on the wall under the bench. She uses her magic on it, which opens up a small nook with a book inside. Biting her lip, Valia pulled it out, and then she carefully replaced the stone brick that sat on the bench as though nothing at all were amiss. She opened the book, unsure what to expect. It was filled with script in a fast, careless hand, feminine but not soft in the slightest. In the year 512 exalted, it began, my brother Garahel and I flew to Antiva City. Chapter 2, 512 Exalted Isia rides on a griffin for the second time as she rides off to war. Neither her nor her brother Garahel was ready for the blight, but it was here. Normally it would have taken another year of traveling to even ride a griffin into combat, but less than a year into their training, they had to be ready. Four months ago, the first of the Darkspawn had come out of the ground and were now approaching Antiva City. 
As Isia rides behind Hubble, her senior warden, who is actually flying the Griffin, she notices refugees outside the locked gates of Antiva City, waiting for help that will never come. It's hard for her to look at. As they land in the royal palace, two dozen griffins roost around the area, all from other wardens who are meeting with the Antiva royal family. Garahel also lands with the warden he was traveling with. Isia thinks on how her brother is more beautiful of the two, something that she was actually thankful for. Beauty is a curse for elven women. The group makes it to a small hall where the king and queen of Antiva talk to the warden commander of Antiva, a dwarven man named Turab. Queen Guivana asks the wardens if they have come to save Antiva, but she's bluntly told, no, the city cannot be defended and must be evacuated. The royals go pale. They wish for their city to be saved or else all their culture will be lost. Everything they worked for just gone. Turab continues that the other wardens have come to take important war assets out of the city, but the rest of the citizens will need to leave by whatever boat can hold them, but there won't be enough for even a third of the population. King Eladio thinks for a moment and says that he must have time for his decision and calls for the meeting to end. As the wardens leave, Garahel whispers disbelief to his sister that the royals think this place can actually be saved. The wardens came to give them hope, and when it wasn't good enough, they asked for more. Isia stands in the wardens' temporary quarters, looking at how nicely the servants have decorated for them, trying to ask for hope. She says to herself that they have to be saved, but does it so quietly no one else hears. Chapter 3, 512 Exalted the next morning, Turab splits the wardens into pairs to scout the surrounding area for any escape routes. As Hubble and Isia climb into the air in his griffin, she notices that there are less ships in the harbor. She asks him if the king has chosen to flee. Hubble says that he has still not actually decided, but word of the meeting had gone out and ship's captains began to flee from the port, leaving behind any who were not quick enough. Isia and Hubble fly out, eventually coming across the horde. While she is able to count about 50 ogres, there are just countless other herlocks and genlocks. It would be impossible to fight them all. As the griffin began to climb through the clouds that follow the blight, Isia heard a faint, strange melody seep into her mind. She had no sense of it as an actual sound. Rather, it seemed to come from within, almost as if she were humming the tune to herself. She could never have imagined such a song, though. It was the most beautiful thing she'd ever heard, aching and ethereal. It seemed to pull her towards a memory of nostalgic bliss that she had somehow lost, but that she would do anything to recover. Anything at all. Isia notices that Hubble is also enraptured by the music and slaps his back to wake him up. He quickly gains control of his griffin and thanks her. When she asks what that was, he mentions that it was the call of an archdemon. Isia is stunned into silence, conflicted to how horrible the blight in the archdemon is with how sweet the song was. Later that night, Isia sits alone, listening to her brother's loud stories he tells to the other wardens. Turab comes back then from another meeting with the king, and defeat is all across his face. He tells him that the queen still wants to fight for her city, and evacuation is almost impossible now, as almost all of the ships have left. Garel asks what they should do now, and Turab says that they have three ships left, and they'll be filled with as many important people as they can. Anyone who can fight against the Blight or has good connections. He tells a few of the mage wardens that they will be on the ship as well, and for the rest of them, they will take the griffins out, carrying the most important people on their backs, including the royal family. But to do that, the new wardens must meet their new griffins. Chapter 4, 512 Exalted. Garahel, Isia, two twin sisters named Kaya and Taya, and an Anders man are the five newest members of the griffin riders. And so, they go out with Turab to meet their new partner. Turab tells him that the griffins that were picked are either new or had just lost their rider. While the wardens did have pairs picked out, it was best if the pairs picked themselves. So the young wardens go to meet their griffins. Isia becomes instantly smitten by a black female griffin with a scar on her neck. She is able to read the griffin's name inscribed in her chest plate, Rivas, the elven word for freedom. Hearing her name, Rivas rests her head on Isia, bringing her in closer. Turab mentions that Rivas is actually in mourning as she just lost her rider, a Dalish man named Dal Siral, who gave his life to save his griffin. Not too far away, Geral had befriended an odd-looking griffin. He was a young one with unusual coloring, white with brindled brownish gray. One of his ears flopped over and his tail seemed to be much more bushy than it should. Isia asks her brother if his griffin has a name. Does he have a name? Thunder according to the chest plate, but I don't think that fits, do you? Garahel asked the griffin. The big animal flattened his ears and hissed, sticking his tongue out. The elf nodded sagely at this response. That's what I thought. So we'll need something else. Oddbird, maybe? 
Scruffy? Nah, too predictable. Scragglebeak. Hmm. No, it sounds like a generic pirate in need of a shave. Ah, I know. Crooky Tail. Crooky Tail, Izzy repeated. You want to name your war griffin Crooky Tail. He likes it better, don't you? Garahel cooed, scratching under the griffin's chin. Issy a bit her tongue. There were bigger concerns in the world than her brother giving an undignified name to his griffin. And really, if there was a single griffin in Thetis who was going to have a ludicrous name, it might as well be that one. Nobody could possibly take the poor beast seriously anyway. With all the other rioters having chosen a griffin, Turab calls them over to take their orders. They are to take one passenger and flee the city. They must not fight, and the goal is to flee to Wycombe. He leads the young wardens to find their charges, when they notice how empty the palace is. Soon, they find their first body. The commoners had found out that they were being kept from fleeing and now await their doom. They have attacked the nobility. The wardens rush to where they hear the most fighting and find Queen Eladio dead, killed by one of his own guards. The queen and a few other scared nobles hid in the back of the room, protected by the wardens. The guards call out to the wardens, saying that they have no business with them. All they want is the royals. But they refuse to stand down. Eventually, all the guards are cut down by the wardens. When Kaya asks about the king, she is told that the king has been killed by Darkspawn. When the queen protests that it's not true, she is told that the people need morale, and a king murdered by his own personal guard isn't what they need. If not for the Darkspawn, he probably would have been well-loved. So he technically was killed by Darkspawn, if not directly. The young wardens are given their charges then. Issy is paired with a young noblewoman named Amadis, who skillfully steals weapons off the dead. Garahel takes Kaelin, a mysterious mage. Issia found it strange that he didn't actually fight at all. It seemed that he was not threatened by this exchange. And so, they quickly rushed their griffins to escape. Chapter 5. 512 Exalted The bells of Antiva City were ringing, and as Issia looked out to the city, she noticed it was on fire. The Darkspawn had already broken through the city gates and were massacring the city. Issia and Amadis rise up on Ravas, seeing the destruction of the Jewel of Antiva. Amadis notices how bothered Issia is and tells her that they must survive to take revenge. Issia notes that she isn't your average noble and asks who she is. Amadis responds that she's from Starkhaven and that she was sent here to find a suitor, but being a noble doesn't always mean that they are useless in a fight. Then the two spot the archdemon in flight. It spews dark fire from its mouth and takes down two wardens, one of them being Hubble and the rider who is taking the Queen of Antiva. Issia doesn't even hear their scream as they fall to their deaths. But worse, it's coming for the others. Issia freezes, but notices her brother swooping in on Crooky Tail, intercepting the Archdemon. It takes her a minute to realize Garahel's plan. He means to distract it so that the others can escape, but he won't be doing it alone. She calls her Avaz to go towards the Archdemon as she watches the others fly to safety. They only need to survive a few minutes. Issia tries to use her magic on the hide of the Archdemon, but it doesn't even notice. Rivas finally tears into it with its claws, causing the Archdemon to cry out. The Archdemon abandons his pursuit of Crooked Tail to find Rivas. While Garahel had the time to save himself, he's refused. His passenger, Kaelin, raises his staff to shoot a fireball. Garahel and Issia find themselves face to face with the Archdemon, and as it breathes in to attack them, Issia is shocked at the sense of its magic. It was nothing from the Fade. She didn't know this magic. They are then caught in a vortex, unable to get free. With the last of his strength, Kaelin cast a cage around the Archdemon. While it had absolutely no hope to hold the beast, it gave him the moment he needed to cast another blow, knocking both griffins and their passengers away from the Archdemon to some safety. Flying away as fast as they can, when they are able, the group lands to catch their breaths. They met the Archdemon and survived. Chapter 6 941 Dragon Two months after the Hosberg mages arrived in Weishaub, they had yet to take their joining or even hear about when they would. Other refugees from other circles began to trickle in since they arrived. But she worried. If the Chantry came calling on the mages, would the wardens protect them? So one morning, she finds Caronel. She asks him quite bluntly when they will take their joining. He questions how she knew where he was, and she hands him a letter from Barith, scented heavily with lavender. Apparently, the young girl had been memorizing his schedule, and Valia was given the information in exchange for a promise to deliver the letter. Karenel sighs, saying that she is very much a child and also persistent, and tucks the letter in his book. Valia asks if they haven't taken the joining because they are so young. He admits that it's part of the reason, but another part is that they might not survive the joining, and they are needed to search the libraries. 
He then asks why she is so eager. The urgency is that I'm not sure we are safe. Genuine puzzlement shone in Caranel's eyes. The morning shade, she noted absently, made them bluer. Who would threaten you here? Valya shrugged unhappily. The same people who threatened us in Hosberg? Templars? The Chantry? People who fear apostate mages. You're an elf. You don't have Dalish markings, so you must have grown up in the alienage like I did. Surely then you have some idea what it's like to depend on the protection of people who don't consider you one of them. The older elf's smile was a little sad. He asks Valya if she wants to be a warden, and she says she isn't sure, and asks if he did. Caranel says he joined during the Blight, and the world was a different place then. He came from a Ferelden alienage, and the night his town found out that King Caelan had died at Ostagar, a riot broke out. His parents' shop burned down. He became a warden to save himself, not save the humanity that burned everything his parents had. He tells Valia that he isn't pressing them to become wardens so quickly because he wishes he had the choice again. Valia then asks again, will they be protected from the Templars? And he replies that he will defend her, as will the first warden. A week later, the Templars arrived. When they finally enter the keep, she watches from afar as a small group of Templars are met by Solway. Valia doesn't remember them from Hosberg and overhears Solway asking about Templars in the south. The Templar leader, de Guir, tells them that the wardens that they should have met have all vanished, and the locals of the areas have told them that they all left in a hurry, selling them all their livestock for very cheap. They also have letters from wardens' families, but none from any wardens checking in. Valia is surprised to hear that there are also refugees coming from Orlay. Over time, she's able to piece together rumors of the Templars. There had been eight, but two died and one deserted. From what she heard, the lost members had something to do with their lack of lyrium. During one of their work days, Seika tells Valia that the Templars that came just want peace. She asks him how he knows this, and he replies that he actually talked with them, and she should too, as they might one day be brothers in arms. Seika mentions that they are safe so long as the First Warden doesn't decide to pick a side in the Mage Templar War. Valia says that they probably then need to find something that the Wardens will find useful to secure their place here. Chapter 7 512 Exalted Isia is meeting with Warden Commander Sinast. She's upset that the royal family of Antiva is lost, as well as some very good wardens. They had made it to Wycombe, a city also soon to be lost by the Darkspawn, and they were in just as much denial about it. Isia thinks that they should be taking all of their boats out to islands where the Darkspawns can't reach, but she knows they can't. This is a fishing town, and they don't have the boats for that kind of travel. Unlike Antiva, this place could really only stand and fight. People on horseback would be able to flee the horde, but anyone walking or pulling wagons wouldn't make it. Sinas questions Issia on how she survived, while more experienced wardens did not. She explains that Garahel had baited the archteam away, and she briefly helped. They survived thanks to Kaelin, the mage. Sinas that her part was not so small. Standing up to the archdemon takes a great amount of courage. She tells Issia of the next part of her mission that Isia and Garahel will be going to the Anderfels to gather troops. Because of their encounter with the Archdemon, Sinas believes that they will be able to gain their respect faster. And unlike Orle and Tevinter, the Anderfels won't look down on them for being elves. Isia leaves and walking through Wycombe, she sees a city getting ready to flee. She walks into a tavern and a hush covers the people inside until they see her uniform. An elf is no trouble as long as they can be categorized. She gets a drink from the counter and sees her brother and some other warden sitting at the best table in the tavern. She goes to sit with them. As they talk, Isia finds out that Garahel has been given the same warden as she has, which she is excited that they get to stay together. Amadis mentions that she'll be going with them. Isia questions if that goes against her orders, but Amadis says that she's not a warden and she can go where she pleases if Sinas wants her help in Starkhaven. Why would she want your help in Starkhaven? Isia asked. You're not really a crow, are you? No, Amadis laughed, shaking her head. She pointed to Kaelin, who hadn't budged from his seat in the shadow corner. He's the Antivan crow. I told you the truth when we were in the air. I'm the second daughter of Phaedrus Vale, cousin to the Prince of Starkhaven. And the leader of the Ruby Drakes, Garahel said, which might be more important. Isia nodded slowly. She heard of the Ruby Drakes, and the rumor that the mercenary's new leader was a young noblewoman from the Free Marches. They were said to field a fighting force of a thousand infantry, 300 horse, 200 archers, and 20 battle-trained mages. And perhaps the greatest measure of their strength was that the Chantry's Templars had never tried to seize those apostate mages. The group talks and the conversation turns to people in Wycombe. They need to save them, but don't know how. After a bit, Isia is reminded of Aravels, 
Dela's ships that gracefully float in the air. It's magic that lets them pass through the forests. Kaelin asks if she knows how to make one, and Nissia mentions that she doesn't. But she knows it can be done, and they have a week to do it. Chapter 8, 512 Exalted. It didn't take a week. It only took three days to get their first Arabelle working. It looked like a reinforced fishing boat with awkward wheels, because that's what it was. Sinast heard of what they were doing and sent in two other senior wardens to help. Isia had managed to figure out that modifying force blasts was able to hold the Aravels about 20 feet off the ground. But while she could make it float, she couldn't make it fly. To which the plan was to attach the load to a griffin and just fly low to the ground. Amadis tells them that Sinas gave an order to build as many possible and they will be starting to take out refugees to Star Cayman in the next few days. While Garahel is excited to save the town, Isia thinks on how they will only really be able to save a few. During the building of the Aravels, Garahel proved to be awful with the hammer, and Amadis not much better. Eventually, Garahel would take letters on Griffin back across Thetis from Amadis. Isia asks Amadis if Sinast isn't annoyed that she's using Griffins for such a silly matter. Of course not, Amadis replied, her dark eyes widening in surprise. She tossed her sleek black hair with a laugh. What better use could there be for him? He's got no gift for magic, and he's hopeless with the saw. You've seen it yourself. Ask him to help build Aravels and he finds a way to sink those fishing boats on land. But what he can do is ride that funny looking griffin to the far corners of Thetis at extraordinary speeds. And there, he can use his gifts of charm to win lords and ladies and hardened killers to our cause. Do you have any idea what kind of prestige those people attach to a personal message signed by the princess captain of the Ruby Drakes and delivered by a grey warden on a griffin? That's a tale for their grandchildren, if they live long enough to have any. It's something to tell their friends and all their underlings. For those who aren't prone to awe, it's a pointed reminder of the force we can exert at will. Either way, it makes it very, very difficult for them to say no. The letters worked. Every day, Garahel would return with promises of aid and more. A week after Isia thought of the idea, the first travel with the Aravels was set. Eighteen in total, nine per griffin, were set out and filled with people. Townfolk held all they could, most wearing their best clothes and chickens strapped to the sides. Rivas and Crooked Tail braided themselves. Garahel has to have a maid to help him with the Aravels, while Isia has to do both at once. She tells Rivas to lift and begins to work her magic, and off the caravan goes. It took most of a day's travel to reach Stark Haven, and the makeshift Aravel stopped once for people to take a break and eat. And when it turns nighttime, they finally reach the city. Stark Haven opens its doors wide to welcome the wardens and the people. The people of the city pour out, giving the refugees food and throwing a feast of welcome. Isia wonders if they will have the same attitude when the city is overrun with people. Seemingly having the same idea, an older woman comes up to Isia and asks if they will really find a place for them all. This is a blight, Isia said. A flinty edge crept into her voice. She heard it and saw the round wind flinch in response, but she didn't stop herself. She was too tired for that. You can fight and you will. You made that choice when you stepped into the Aravel. We won't be able to get everyone out of Wycombe. We don't have enough boats or enough griffins or enough mages to save them all. Someone else will die because you took their place. So you will fight, or I'll gut you myself for wasting my effort in a spot that could have gone to someone with some courage. The woman is shocked and quickly runs away. Garahel comes up to her, questioning her words, but she fires back that he is the one to rally the people. She's just the one to save them. He tells her that it isn't true, but tells her to relax for just one night, and let her feel like the hero she is. Isia doesn't want to, as she has to work to do, but Garahel says that she actually doesn't. Sinas has ordered other Starkhaven wardens to go back to Wycom ASAP, and there will be shifts for the refugees. Garahel and Isia will be going to the Anderfels in the morning. So be a hero tonight, because tomorrow they will just be Grey Wardens. Discussion First, let's start off by thanking the artists of the week. It's been a while since we have done one of these. Oh no. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mai, for this great drawing of Garahel. Fun facts, this is literally the first entry I ever got for this series, and Mai has been so, so patient to see this coming into a video. So thank you so much. So something that has sort of driven me crazy, which I will get into in the last episode, but for now, there's just so many characters. Like, you thought the calling was packed? Just wait for this one. In an effort just to keep them straight, I will be continuing on with a list of characters that are named, described physically, and appear in more than one scene. While well, part of this is to just highlight how many there are, it's also because I honestly just have the 
worst time keeping them all apart. In the present, Valia, a mage in the circle of Hosberg and a city elf who had been to the circle and is also the main protagonist of the present. She is about 18 or 19 as she has just taken her harrowing. Senior Enchanter Eliphas, an older mage from Hosberg with a white beard. He is the one who set up the mages going to sanctuary with the wardens. Berith, a shameless 16 year old mage from Hosberg. She has a crush on Caranel. Padden, the oldest of the mages, minus Eliphas, also the tallest. She is shy with pox scarred cheeks. Seika, a 16 year old boy who got his magic when the family's farm was attacked by Herlocks. Warden Solway, a warrior woman with muscular arms and a giant scar across her lip, showing her silver teeth. Warden Caranel, a handsome elf from a Ferelden alienage in his early 20s, signed up to be a warden during the Fifth Blight. Light Lieutenant de Guer, the leader of the Refugee Templars, a devout man unsure of his choice to abandon the Templar Order. Templar Laros, a fat dwarven Templar who eats away his troubles. Templar Rhinus, a female Templar who never smiled but was extremely gentle. In the past, Isia, an Ella mage who is new to the Wardens, sister to Garahel, and is almost his exact opposite, being somber and preferring isolation. She is the main character of the past. Garahel, an elven warden brother to Isia, he is a warm, friendly, and very charming young man. Warden Hubble, senior warden that dies. Warden Commander Turub, dwarven leader of the Grey Wardens in Antiva. King Eladio and Queen Guavana, the rulers of Antiva, married for love, which was rare, and they're dead. Warden Dendi, a mage with scars and long black hair. She isn't happy with how the wardens are only taking the nobles. Dies along with Hubble. Warden Kaya and Warden Taya, twin griffin riders, also young and who shave their head. Amadis Vale, niece of the Prince of Starkhaven and leader of the Ruby Drakes, a respected mercenary group. Kaelin de Avaliste, a powerful mage who is also an Antivan Crow. Warden Commander Sanast, another warden leader likely of the Free Marshes. For those of you who think, oh, that's not that many characters for a novel, remember that a lot of these characters are only in just one or two scenes, and then they died, they're gone, we're never going to hear from them again. I also didn't mention any character who didn't meet my criteria. There was a bunch of characters who were named, but not described. There's a bunch of characters who were named and described, but were only in one scene. There was a bunch of characters who were not named, but were described and are also in more than one scene. There's just so many. We haven't even gotten to some of the main cast yet which is just kind of crazy. So I'm going to keep this this list intact so as we go on, we can see the final of everyone who has been at least in more than one scene here named and has a physical description. The book states that the map was marked with the elven word for griffin, but we don't actually know what that word is. It's never mentioned in the novel nor anywhere else I know in the series. When Valya is looking at the map, she notices two branches of griffin riders on the wardens, one in red and the other in blue. Isia and Garahel are in the red wing. I skipped the descriptions of the griffins in the summary, but they are big animals. An adult can grow 12 feet from head to tail, males weighed about a thousand pounds, and females are only slightly less. And on top of all of that, their claws can shred plate mail. You cannot tell a griffin who gets to ride them. They allow themselves to be ridden. They are partners, not mounts. Their most common color is gray, and black seems to be normal as well, but brown seems very unlikely. Anna writes, even though Isia says griffins are nothing like a dog, they remind me of a Mabari. Like Mabari, it's the griffin who chooses its owner and not the other way around. Well, Mabari are probably not so popular than the Anderfels, so she may not know about them. And I agree. The way the griffins are written, a, a croaky tale most of all, they seem to understand what people are saying and even react to what is said, kind of like the Mabaris do. Heck, the writer on the BSM forum says that she based Crooked Tail off of her own dog. And while she did post a picture, the Wayback Machine apparently doesn't save it, so yeah, whatever. But anyway, a new Dragon Age game where you're a griffin surrounded by Mabaris. Make it happen. At one point, Isia mentions that everyone, including her alienage, knew about the calling. On this, Yash writes, Isia also mentions that everyone knew about the calling, but in Dragon Age Origins, this is a secret deliberately kept from new recruits until after the joining. It is possible that the knowledge was lost to outsiders in the interim or even covered up by the Wardens, but the way Isia describes it makes me think it's part of stories and legends about the Grey Wardens and changing them would be difficult. So, on the BSM forums, the writer actually comments on this. I'll just read what she wrote because I, that's just easier. My impression was always that the PC's ignorance at the beginning of Dragon Age Origins was just to give the NPCs a reason to explain information that we the players needed to have. And it makes sense for pretty much all the origin stories that your PC wouldn't have that info. So it was a completely reasonable and warranted storytelling choice. Afterwards, it wasn't necessary to rehash the information. So the level of NPC background knowledge seemed to vary depending on what offered the best dramatic potential. 
For example, Morrigan not only knows a lot of Warden lore, but has new and interesting ways of manipulating the magic with the old god baby. So given that there's some predecessors for in-game characters having different levels of information about Warden lore, I opted for what best fit the story I wanted to tell. It was more streamlined to have the Hosberg mages already semi-familiar with Warden lore, and I felt that there was enough canon justification to make that work. They're politically aligned, plus wardens and mages do have some shared interest when it comes to lyrium supplies, magical research, defense against darkspawn, etc. And then after that, all the characters have been sitting around Wysup studying up on warden history and lore for a while, so I was like, good enough, rock on. And after hearing her reasoning, I... I don't know, I'm not... It's not satisfying to me, I guess. I still kind of side with Yash on this, but at least knowing her thought process is a little bit interesting. Perhaps I missed this, but the book reads that there are two dozen griffins in Antiva City, but only seven seem to be taking people out of Antiva City. Where did the others go? I honestly, I have poured over that chapter trying to figure out where the other ones went. Did they just leave for some reason? Why? They knew they were going to have a problem with it, like evacuating people. Why did they just not keep them? What did I miss here? <laughs> I generally don't know what happened. At one point, Garahel mentions that he has seduced a Canari. However, the Canari people did not make contact with Adis until well over a hundred years later. The writer would also go on the BSM forums to comment about this. I wanted to use ogres. Ogres are cool, which meant that the Canari could not be totally removed from the rest of the world, since you have to have Canari to get ogres. When I started writing this book, I had not yet read through the world of Thetis, so I didn't know about the Darkspawn Slaughtered Colony in the Kokari Wilds. That would have been a shortcut to the entire thing. But since I wasn't aware of that then, my reasoning went, a world that has high-speed aerial travel is a smaller world than the one that doesn't. And a Grey Warden who just happens to fly overhead and spot one of those guys is probably going to be all, whoa, what is that? And drop down to investigate. Therefore, it would not be completely unreasonable to think that isolated contact might have been made once or twice by that or other means and that at least some Grey Warden scouts might have at least broadly be aware of what Canari are, if only to the limited extent of, hey, these guys are not Darkspawn, but we don't need to freak out about them even though they look kind of weird. But of course, that's not their primary focus, and it's also not hard to imagine what a few Wardens who maybe hypothetically did know about Canari got wiped during the Force Blight, and then there are no more Griffins, so the possibility of accidental recontact goes way down, and we get back to a world state where nobody remembers what Canari are until they invade. However, at the same time, I didn't want to portray Canari as being so common or widely known that would actually make an on-screen appearance in Last Flight, because then there would clearly be a canon conflict. To split the difference and got a one-off mention in a throwaway line, I figured that would cover all my bases as to who knew what when and how there would be ogres in the fourth blight, as the readers who cared enough to worry about that kind of stuff would be able to make that connection and everyone else would just skip past it. But obviously, I'm not actually all that confident that it worked, which is why I wrote this long spoiler explanation about it. So... Again, I think her reasoning is unsatisfactory, and then also not having read the world of Thetis. Ah, I, I don't know. So I'll mention this later on, but it sounds like she had a really short time crunch to write this novel, and she even thinks that I actually heard it in the end. So I, I, I understand that she probably didn't actually have time to read World of Thetis yet. But that being said, it's it's also like aren't there aren't there editors for this? This is really nitpicky, but some of the word choices in this book bother me. At one point, it uses the word sepulchral, which I have trouble pronouncing, but we're going to go past that. And it's a big fancy word that you probably find in your SAT study book, which, okay, that's fine. Use fancy words. I really don't mind that. But then just a few chapters later, she uses unlight to describe what Archie and fire looks like, which sounds just comically childish, like my dude. Unlight is literally just darkness. I, what is unlight? Unlight is just darkness. Uh. <laughs> and, and like, th both of these things technically happen in Isia's head, and it, it just feels so off to me. Why would a, an elven warden, who probably wasn't in the circle, and was it like a city elf, she would know what sepulchre is, but say unlight and not darkness? I just... I, really, if anything, unlight is what gives me the most. I just don't understand this. So I kind of skipped over this, but essentially what the Hosberg mages are doing is looking for signs of what's currently happening with the Wardens in 
Dragon Age Inquisition. They're trying to look for any signs of Corypheus, other signs of magic sidereal, or blood magic and words being manipulated. It kind of actually sounds like that even though the Inquisition doesn't really know what's going on with the Wardens, the Wardens in Weishaupt do have an idea that the Wardens in there are probably being manipulated by Corypheus with blood magic, and then they're also not really doing anything about it other than just wondering what's going on and if this has happened before. So it's interesting that, I, I don't know, the Wardens just kind of seem to abandon the Elysian for Elden Wardens going, ah, shit. <laughs> that sucks. <laughs> But apparently, as of Chapter 6, the Hosberg mages have actually found some odd things. As for all that work, they found maybe four references to wardens who had disappeared mysteriously, one darkspawn with uncanny abilities of speech and reasoning, and two or three possibly related incidents they weren't sure the Grey Chamberlain would deem relevant. What had barked for his consideration anyway? At this point, I can't remember if it's ever explained more, but I do wonder if the Wardens did come in contact with maybe another Magister Sidereal. So, have that food for thought. So, Warden Commander Turob just dies, somehow. It's suggested that he fell to his death alone with Hubble, but it's never actually said that he does. He just is there, and then isn't. And next you hear his name, he's dead. Honestly, his character Hubble and Dendi, who I didn't even mention in the summary, should have just been one person. And then that person dies. And you know, honestly, I didn't even notice that Turob just poofs away even on a second reading. It took me until writing the summary that I noticed. While reading, I just honestly confused Hubble and Turob and forgot they were just two different people. And with that, thank you to everyone who submitted entries, and I look forward to what everyone comes up with next. If you have any comments, artwork, or anything else, please send it in. Our next section will consist of chapters 9 through 18 of Last Flight, so please send in your things by February 17th, 2019. Either comment below or send an email at gildothelen at gmail.com. Tweet at Gildothelen on Twitter or PM user Gildothelen on Reddit. Dara Sharal.